what is a sustainable version of sexuality? And mm -hmm. because we're clearly seeing the opposite of that, we're clearly seeing a sexuality that's just kind of destroying more than it's giving life. And so I think most people who are relatively looking <laughs> under the carpet, you know, behind the curtains, they can see that it's not working, but very few people can offer any semblance of a solution or a vision. So I wanted to really focus on that, but just as preamble, I just kind of getting to know you, I'd love to know, yeah, like yeah. I see your Instagram and you do like retreats. It seems like a lot that seems yeah. to be your focus. Yeah. Yeah. So to answer your initial question before the recording, essentially when I was living in the United States, I'm from Australia originally, I grew up in far North Queensland and I decided to take the leap of faith to jump across the pond and go to university in Milwaukee in Wisconsin. And that was out of a pursuit to follow my passions at the time, which was to play sports. I was really loving football and my dream was to be a professional football player. You know, I was like, that was my thing. And that took me to the United States because if I ever got injured, I would have an education to fall back on. That's why I did the college system in Australia. It's kind of like, the pathway for a footballer is you go over to Europe and you say goodbye to Australia, you go over to Europe and give it a crack to play in England or something like that. Or you don't go to university and you give it a crack playing at the clubs here. And I thought, what a great experience to go and live on another country, which growing up, I'd never been to the US, but I had seen a lot of American movies. And what was your concept going into America? Do you have any like strong concepts? Man, it was wild because... <laughs> All the stereotypes and all the things that I seen in movie, which they, you know, they kind of heighten the extremes of in films. Yeah, yeah. When I was there, I was like, oh my God, this is a culture shock. Cause this is kind of like <laughs> what it's like. I feel like I'm in a movie or something. And then all of a sudden, you know, lo and behold, I was in a movie in the end, <laughs> but <laughs> like just inception. Like, somehow. Yeah, absolutely, man. <laughs> absolutely. Inception. But the whole American pie growing up on that culture of the college parties and the red cup thing and all the drinking games and the athlete jock kind of persona and all of these different stereotypical mask or personalities that is kind of part and parcel with the college era in Australia we don't have that it's totally different in the university space but there are many parallels let's say I would my general hypothesis of the whole kind of hypersexualization of Western culture, particularly in Europe, as I traveled for Europe as well, and America and Australia, they have these overlaps, which I'm sure we're going to go into in more depth with the yeah. conversation today. But for me, yeah, I had no idea I would be in a documentary film about sexuality being the new revolution of the world. <laughs> yeah. And that all happened by chance, to be honest. I like to believe that it happened by synchro destiny, which is a blend of a word that I came up with around the synchronicity and destiny all pulled into one where ultimately at the time I couldn't see it, but there was a part of me that I even remember I reflect on this moment so much because it's had such a significant part and role to play in my life and my development and my being and just in my awareness of myself in relation to others and also my worldview around how I understand and comprehend the mechanisms of what makes the world move it's played a huge role in my life but it was well, all can, we, was can we peel that back a little bit because you sure, sure. you're like this australian who had visions of being an athlete and you could have chosen europe you didn't you didn't even choose america you chose milwaukee which i think most americans haven't been to milwaukee it's a very kind of specific part of the country and so these aspirations are, I want to be an athlete and obviously you want to be a good athlete. Probably you want to be a professional athlete on some level. That's your thinking. And then you wind up in America and you have these concepts about the party culture. And was it kind of like a wish fulfilled or was it more like, this is not what I signed up for? Like how much of what you wanted to accomplish was accomplished you know, this dream, this vision that you had, because I'm also like, I'm from Canada, which is next to America, but I also just learned about America from movies. There's only two cities in America. There's LA and there's New York. That's why I, I didn't even know anything about Milwaukee, but there is like the place where dreams are meant to come true. That's the, 
I guess, bumper sticker of America. So you had a dream and you went to pursue this dream in America. So like, did you land? And then you're just like, all systems go, let's go, let's go, let's go. How were you when you first arrived? Yeah, man, that is a great question. And I love your thinking around that. Did it fulfill my dreams or was it not what I expected? And definitely from the get-go, as I arrived, it was fulfilling all my dreams because we were straight into the preseason of football. We were training three times a day. All I had to worry about was um, eating, sleeping, and then training. I was like, yes, I've made it. This is it. And um, I had a really quite successful career of playing in my early days. I got set back with a few injuries later on, which also played a big role in um, my development and my kind of personal growth in that sense, which was hard at the time, but later I really come to appreciate and see the value in it. But then, so a couple months into the, you know, program, I was doing really well, playing, winning games, come in as a newbie, but performing quite well. And even at that point, being so young and naive and fresh, kind of seeing opportunities, new opportunities coming forth really frequently and really often. And because I was kind of performing on the pitch with the older guys, the seniors and the captains, and they were really quite impressed with my abilities on the field. It kind of took me under their wing and they wanted to kind of show me the ropes off the field as well, so to speak. So I was actually 17 when I made the move. My birthday is later on in the year. And we have a different education system for high school here in Australia. So I finished earlier. I wasn't even legal to drink in my own country in Australia and it's 21 in the United States yet I had these um, mentors and these older players <laughs> older teammates mm -hmm. taking me out on nights out and going to these wild parties and getting into the club scene from an early get-go and in Australia it's common that we would go to the bars and nightclubs and party when we're underage like 16 17 and then 18 is legal I did have experience in that sense but then suddenly I wasn't even legal in Australia. And now it's 21 in the United States. Our football team was mostly international players. We had players from Europe, England, Germany, Sweden, Africa, Ghana, all over the world, you know, even players from South America, Colombia and Venezuela and Chile. And then here's me, this white skinny <laughs> Australian kid <laughs> in the mix of it all. But I guess when I was over there as well, really focused my focus primary focus was sports and then having left all of my friends and all of my family behind in Australia it was really hard to stay in touch because even though there was like Facebook and things at those times the time difference was really off and I don't know just to try and schedule a core was challenging so I often wouldn't speak to home that much and even though I was as you said I was right in the mix of it from the get-go I was just so focused from the beginning there were still parts of me that were missing and I seek to have to fill those parts with the validation of spending time with different women. And so I'd hang out with all these different girls and I ended up getting into a relationship quite quickly, which ended fairly sourly right before the spring break episode where the film was captured. So that kind of played a big role in my behavior, which is showcased on the film. But I don't want to take anything away because that was what my behavior was like at that time yeah. in terms of just rampant sexual energy, leaky energy, I would say. Leaky energy is a great way of putting it. Yeah. I mean, I really want to dive deep in some of this stuff. It's really, thank you for opening up. Um, so, I mean, let's get into that because you mentioned you were in two films and I'll give you a proper introduction, you know, uh, I'll record a better introduction in the beginning, but first one was called Liberated, The New Sexual Revolution. And then the second one, there's a sequel that I don't think it's out yet, but I looked, I mean, I, I am DB'd you, I did some research. It's called Liberated After Spring Break. But the first one, you know, to be honest, I've got you on Instagram and I saw that you had made this documentary. I saw the title and I was like instantly both intrigued and also a little bit frightened because usually those type of titles and that type of, you know, wordage, that verbiage leads to, oh, I've got the answer. It's YOLO, the YOLO life. Here's how to be liberated, do whatever you want. But the deeper I dug and to see the actual documentary was very insightful. And I want to unpack this step by step. So the first 
aspect of this about the movie is you were just leading up to this in your own narrative is that you were young, you were surrounded by a bunch of jocks. And in America, that has a very clear connotation. Like the jocks are pretty unruly. And you had just been in your first kind of relationship overseas that just ended. And then hence you're kind of whisked away to spring break in Florida. Daytona Beach, yeah? Panama City Beach, it was actually. Panama City, okay. Yeah. And I want to know, like, what did you know? Had you heard any of the lore? Because there's a lot of lore definitely in kind of the college circuit about spring break, what that means. Their entire television genres, Jerry Springer and all this is about like spring break, girls gone wild, like this kind of nonsense. And did you have any concepts going in? when you were being asked to go to spring break or were you kind of going in blind and innocently? Oh, absolutely. We knew what was going on. That was a, you know, as you said, it's quite blatantly obvious what happens at spring break. It is a bit of a wild time. And we were excited by that as young sportsmen who had been dedicated to training and having a week off to go and be wild for a moment. Because I would say like in Australia, we have something called, um, forgotten the name now but basically it's the celebration after you graduate high school okay. and it's called schoolies week so schoolies. it's basically same That's thing adorable <laughs> yeah it's super <laughs> cute all the australian kids go on a wild week bender in a, one of this beautiful beach locations around the country and basically just go and celebrate finishing school grade 12 and go and get drunk and go to music events and get go wild of course i had an idea of what spring break would be like but it was kind of like i tell people schoolies on steroids <laughs> so time schoolies by 10 you know there's like twenty thousand people at this beach party going off and um yeah it was definitely um and having been in that kind of sporting environment we were definitely we had this camaraderie around us because when we went to spring break, it was pretty much the guys who played football together. And we had a lot of competitiveness because we were all, you know, performing to play well on the pitch. And then also off the pitch, we were also performing to play well, you know, in a sense yeah. that we would really egg each other on and there'd be this competitiveness. And when that came to not how many goals you could score, but how many girls you could score, we took it very seriously because we, you train you play like you train and we kind of took that mentality into other areas of our lives and when that was our main core group like again I didn't have any family around me or any friends that was my family and that sure. hyper competitiveness was taken off the pitch into all areas of life essentially so um and yeah, so getting... like it really sounds like a fraternal environment it's like a bunch of bros Bro, like egging each other on. I get that. But there's a clear lack of parental supervision and oversight and foresight, right? There's no foresight, just a bunch of idiots and you typically just, yeah. you know, hewed up and ready to go. And so was there any sense like these coaches know what's going on? Do they ever offer any sage advice or do they steer clear of any you know, getting, staying out of your personal lives, because in a sense, it does impact your performance on the field. If you're running around doing all sorts of crazy stuff, did you ever yeah. get any talkings by the, by the coach or do they kind of stay out of it? Oh man, that's a great, great question. And I really like that question because even on my own unpacking of the experience and reflection of the time, I was really grateful for the coaching staff that we had during that period in that season of life. They were, I would say, quite young in their career. So they had also been players in the past and kind of been through the journey that I was on, essentially. And they certainly had an awareness of what happens in these environments and these situations and highly likely that they had been through similar kind of experiences themselves. Sure. And I acknowledge that they were offering support with the best skills that they had available for us, which... We were, I would say, so in our own ego that we felt kind of invincible, let's say, because it was a really tricky thing at that university I was at. We were a small university and we had literally no right in being as successful as we were on the field. 
what I mean by that is we had some fantastic plays from around the world. And it was almost like we were so good that no one could tell us what to do because we were that good. It was that kind of mentality. And even the coaches, they didn't want to piss us off because, you know, we were winning games and going to nationals and winning tournaments and all these things. So they, you know, they kind of turned a blind eye, let's say, to what was going on after hours. And at the same time, you know, we ended up a few of the players going and getting a job in the bars and then ended up having late nights. And as you said, like eventually it comes back to hurt the team and everyone is affected by that. And which was evident, but going into it, going to spring break, we were like, let's go. Like we were ready for it and on for it. So there was nothing that was holding us back at that time. And, you know, in terms of your worldview, did you have any kind of issues or awareness of the objectification that takes place? Cause that's actually a big theme of the movie. Like was there on any level, did you feel like eh, this is kind of weird or this is kind of off? Was your conscience allowed or did you leave your conscience in Wisconsin and then, you know, you just went with your, your penis, basically? <laughs> like, what, yeah, what, what, what was it like? Dude, you? I love your questions for this conversation. And I was definitely what I would term in core young dumb and full of cum <laughs> as a bit of a um, a joke to it because i certainly was i had some experience traveling from a young age with my family and with some friends and we spoke earlier about going to bali it's a big thing to do when you're in australia and i've been so privileged to be real in my life and had a diverse range of experiences yet i was still extremely naive to what is real and what is actually happening in the world. And at that point in my life, although I was in a man's body, let's say, I hadn't quite gone through um, an experience that grounded me in the foundational truths of what it means to be a human. And what I mean by that is it's taken me to really explore and research a lot of ancient cultures around the world and how they initiate young boys into manhood and what does it mean to be a man these are some of the themes and questions that the film does a great job to provoke and i want to give full credit to the filmmakers and the team that produced it because they've done it in a really unique way that encourages the viewers to reflect and ask those internal questions and that's relevant because we wouldn't be having this conversation if that wasn't the case so yeah definitely gets people thinking and reflecting on our larger cultural story because I had to you know on reflection of the film and when it was released I went through a, a really challenging time in my life um, one of tremendous self-shaming and a lot of guilt I was carrying a lot of guilt around my actions and my past behaviors and because of that incident because of going to spring break and what took place there is that the shame was around that the shame was mostly around my like when i it's so funny because i have a really hard time and it might not seem obvious because my face is everywhere online and my voice but i have a really difficult time listening to my own voice or watching myself on camera why because i am the most critical self analysis kind of perfectionist person and i have a really hard time seeing myself in a position where i'm look really stupid and look really bad and look really ignorant and it's really humbling um, because a lot of the times although the camera shows a very kind of limited perspective and viewpoint it's only this little view. They don't see the whole wider spectrum of what's going on, which is kind of what we're unpacking with this, this narrative of myself. But I had felt the shame because I looked like an absolute idiot. <laughs> and I was embarrassed. I was really embarrassed because I was like, at that point, they're like, going to release this to the world. Um, they're going to show this to everyone. My family's going to see this. What's my mom going to think about this? What's my dad going to think? What are my friends going to think? What are my school teachers and coaches and all these people that I had? a really respectful kind of honorable and dignified relationship with going to 
think when they see this crazy side of myself, which is like, I laugh about it now, this kind of alter ego persona of this, you know, this kind of wild and ravenous person that is really seeking to, you know, fill this void um, by a means of going out and proving themselves with getting as many as women as possible. So, yeah. Can I, I can I ask, because you brought up this aspect of rite of passage, and I've also looked a lot at that. There's a lot of movements that are trying to resolve what does that look like in this modern era? It's a very important question. And do you think in the void of, especially America is such a young country, right? We don't necessarily have traditions for that rite of passage that stupidity has become the rite of passage and acting like a fool, uh, you know, like these spring break in a sense is a rite of passage. You are a part of a fraternity in your sports league and them whisking you away to this place to do these things is now the default rite of passage in the absence of that sober perspective of longevity, of tradition, of, you know, surviving something. Do you feel like that you were stepping into that and you didn't even, you didn't know, you're just kind of going along with it, but actually you were a part of the rite of passage but that passage is like over a cliff. <laughs> We're not actually uh, passing through <clears throat> something productive. Absolutely, man. You're really hitting the nail on the head there. And I would suggest that our somewhat civilized Western culture um, is seemingly quite lost in a lot of ways because we don't have this fundamental initiation, which is you know, there's many initiations throughout life, birth being one, death being another, but coming into adulthood also being significant for men and for women. As I'm a man, I can't really speak to the women's processes, but I can share a little bit on my journey and experience. And although it may seem, as you suggested, that leaving school or going to spring break or, you know, getting the keys to your first car is a somewhat rite of passage that, yes, I can finally drink now, or I can smoke a cigarette, or I have, you know, full autonomy over my decision-making processes. That may unconsciously be somewhat of a marking point for us to come into our adulthood journey. I would suggest that there's more depths to the psychological maturity that's required in order to have a broader sense of um, what's really happening in the world and what it means to be a human. And when I had a look at all of these different cultural traditions, they all had similar processes. They would go about it in different ways. For example, and I think it's in Vanuatu, they jump from the vines, this like bungee jump thing with the vines attached to them. And that would pull them up. And in a lot of Pacific islands, they do the tattooing on the body and the markings. In the indigenous culture here in Australia, they would go on walkabouts where the young men would have to go and live in the wild and, you know, fend for himself and um, survive essentially. And so the first point is that there would be this separation. So they would go off on their journey on their own and experience tremendous amounts of pain and suffering there will be this moment of having somewhat of a challenge and then after the challenge once they had overcome that on their own they would then return back to their community and this is a really key part is that when they come back to their community they are actually honored and seen and celebrated for their transformation and their wit and their survival in becoming a man. So it becomes a full rounded journey and experience. And so when you said that going to spring break would be like jumping off a cliff, I would say you're hundred percent right. But the bigger um, rite of passage was when I committed to saying yes, to joining the production team to leave. I was back home in Australia at this point to leave my family once again, and leave my friends and embark on a six month journey, traveling with the production team all across the United States and across um, England and Europe to show the film and then suddenly, you know, be confronted with a series of questions from all of these people when I was still trying to kind of process my own experience and feelings. And there was a tremendous period of huge growth for me because I was faced with a lot of hardship and overcoming a lot of that 
psychological um, selfishness and shifting my perspective to have a broader sense of, you know, I had to let go of my own story in that moment and really see the bigger story. It was no longer about me, but it was now about how can, you know, I use my individual experience to showcase to the world what's really possible and how this, you know, larger cultural story at play, although it's not to blame, but has impacted many of our lives and now be the vessel and the example for others to see that we can move beyond this old paradigm way of being in our cultural civilization. So that was a huge, and I would say that process and that journey was more of a rite of passage for me and a big thanks to all of the, um, the mentors and the directors and producers and everyone involved in the organization who, you know, encouraged me and supported me to go through that journey with them. So I have some, I mean, I want to unpack that because that's a very unique, I can't as an action step recommend that everybody have a documentary made about them in order to see how much of a jackass they are, but it is a great experience, but it's extremely, you're kind of an anomaly in that respect. But uh, my first question is when you were embarking on this press tour, this six months tour, had you already begun the evolution of moving on from that version of yourself that was in spring break or was the seed just planted and what really solidified that was these questions that were coming your way during the press that's that's what I, i'd like to know like had you already realized oh man i don't want to be like that guy or did that come out later as you're watching yourself on repeat during these you know because you were in like film festivals and stuff like that so uh, at what point did you start to realize who you are and could see yourself and your actions a little bit more objectively? Yeah, man, that's not, again, another great question. It was definitely like, I'll take you back to the decision when I was at my home and I had just received the email from the directors and the crew. They're saying this film's coming out. Um, we want to give you, so you were in free. Australia home. home yeah, being yeah, that's Australia. right. Okay. Yeah, and I'd received this email basically telling me that they're releasing the film and I had an opportunity to see a glimpse of the film before it got released, just to kind of get the pre-warning on it. So I sat there and watched it. And at this stage in my life, I had really been searching. I'd really been seeking. I'd traveled all through Asia at this point, backpacking and hitchhiking and um, couch surfing and spending time in ashrams and meditation centers and permaculture communities, all these. I was looking for something that was going to give me meaning to my life. Okay, and clarification that you had returned after the first year of American college, university. Yep. And this was your summer break at that point? This was after I had graduated. Oh, okay. University. Because the film took about five years to make. So there was oh, about... Yeah. A yeah, five year period where I kind of traveled a lot. I finished university. Um, I went even down to Central America and Costa Rica and all these beautiful places. And I was on this journey and I had set the intention at that point to really um, open my heart and explore what's really on my heart. And it took me to some challenging places, which revealed a lot of challenges and opportunities for more growth. And every time that one of those challenges arose on a gross level which again the film coming out was one of those challenges because i was like oh my god i watched it and i had just I had begun this journey thinking that i had you know really mastered myself in a way but then seeing myself on camera thinking oh my god i was embarrassed and i was ashamed of myself and my actions and and i was faced with the challenge at that point to go and face the the release of this film and go and join the production team or i can just i could just close the computer look away pretend <laughs> it doesn't exist you know la, la, look la, at la. It. yeah yeah <laughs> exactly try and just like make a avoidance um i really sat with it for a long time and it was really challenging for me to make the final decision because even both of my parents had polarizing viewpoints one said yes go and join the crew the other one said no don't look at it da, 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 da. 
So I had this pulling from both sides and even internally, this massive struggle of like, oh my God, I'm going to, you know, is this how the world's going to see me for all my life? And I really recognized at that point in my life, there was a lot of resistance. I had a lot of resistance to showing up and I lent into the resistance at that moment. I emailed them back and I said, Hey, look, I'm on this healing journey. I'm on this path of um, coming into more awareness and I want to join the um, tour. And they couldn't believe it. They were quite shocked and they, you know, helped me get across to the United States and we began the tour from there. And then that was like walking through another portal of like, oh my God, I had no, I just said yes and committed to this journey. And then boom, it just opened up, you know, my, my eyes to even more growth and even bigger opportunities that I couldn't, before I couldn't perceive or understand or even like conceptualize at that time what was be possible. And I'm not talking about like possibilities of doing retreats or, you know, being on camera or doing any of these things, but opportunities for me to know myself even more and go deeper into who I am and why I'm here and what's, you know, what is ultimately like making up this experience of life. And I think that's the ultimate quest for all of us is to know thyself. Mm -hmm. and that's part of our own individual journeys, but that really became a bit of a, bit of a gateway into a deeper experience because the production crew primarily faith-based. So they were, it was quite controversial for them to come out with this film. They had released other films in the past, but this film was, you know, parental guidance was advised. So it definitely didn't show the glorified image of God. It showed the nitty gritty underground reality of our society. Mm -hmm. And um, these are some hard truths to face, but it's like the polarity, like the light wouldn't exist without the dark and you wouldn't be able to see the extent of the light without really knowing and realizing what extent of the darkness is really there. And yeah, there's, you know, it really challenged my fundamental beliefs about who I am and why I'm here and what is actually going on in this greater cosmological kind of reality of life on this planet. So it's definitely been a huge huge journey so that's crazy it's it's wild that you accepted it but it seems like you had been preparing for that unwittingly like you going in into these retreats and going inside allowed you permission to show your true nature to yourself and also to other people even if it made you look bad right um which is important because i mean high noon the whole our organization is based off the premise of like, what would life look like if you had no shadows? Well, guess what? Bringing those shadows to light is somewhat of a painful process for sure. Cause you have to actually reveal these to other people. It's not just within you, but it, part of that is like showing people, this is the real me, the good and the bad. So it's pretty uh, admirable that you actually said yes. So you were showing yourself and going through this process of meeting all these people, diverse group of people who were checking out this movie and going up repeatedly and answering these questions. And through that, how is your worldview changing? Because you use a lot of highfalutin words like cosmological, <laughs> you know, and so, so forth. So obviously this has deeper meaning than the binary of like good or bad and all this, but like you're learning the nuance of life and reality. And in terms of sexuality, like what, you were leaving one paradigm, clearly, that you were steeped in, that you were celebrating on camera for the whole world to see, and you were shifting that paradigm to see sexuality as something different. So this process, I'd love to hear the evolution of going from totally fine to objectifying women to, hey, that might not be okay. What, what am I a part of? What am I complicit in to wherever you're at now? I'd love to hear a bit about that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I'd like to speak to the catalyst. What was a really big, if I'm really brutally, truthfully honest, the big catalyst for me to shift in my internal perspective. And, and then also I'll kind of speak to 
your question on on you know more of the present perspective now but essentially there's a piece in the film where there's a photo of me with my thumbs up celebrating with my mates that there was a a blood stain on the bed sheets because i just had slept with a virgin the night before and i hadn't really considered at that point in time and it wasn't until the director brought it to my awareness that you know this whole although we were going out and we were having consensual sex with women just very frequently and with a variety of different women i hadn't considered the connecting thread to this culture that is highlighted in the film that it seems to be more prevalent today than ever is this idea of non-consensual sex and rape culture and i had been in the mindset as a young boy that going out and sleeping with lots of different women and having their consent to do that under the influence of drugs and alcohol is totally acceptable and i hadn't put the pieces together that there is you know essentially a spectrum of like going out and having one night stands going out and just kissing someone just hooking up and then how that eventually leads to you know the most devastating kind of behaviors that happens on this earth and um the director had just released a film prior to liberated where they went and filmed in all around the world all of these different countries where primarily it was old white men buying young women around the world for sex and they had gone to a place in Cambodia where it's really prevalent and there's this moment where this young girl who's underage is being sold by a family for sex to this old white man and the image that they captured and what's left i think this young girl gets brutalized and her pajamas are blood stained and that really invoked this question in the director and the organization what is the root cause of this and what kind of culture is breeding an acceptance in the mind of the old man to think that it's okay to go and buy a child for sex right and so they had to go right back and go back to the culture in the united states go back to spring break the hookup culture the one night stand culture you know what it's like in college and connect the threads all the way through to this devastating end result and it was really it was really a heartbreaking moment for me and even as i reflect on it i couldn't there's no way that i could have connected that thread and it wasn't until i was on that tour and i realized i thought whoa that's intense to actually put myself in that space and i thought that's like i could never imagine doing something like that but to see the stepping stones of how to you know get to that end point which no one you know everyone looks at that and thinks oh my god that's horrific which it is but without realizing that agreeing to you know the steps along the thread to get to that point which the film really highlights like i highly recommend if you haven't seen the film it's on netflix go and watch it cuz it's like by the end of it you're kind of like it's hard to look for your hands to watch it because there's so much as you mentioned before this objectification of women but this entitlement of the man who think that it's okay for us men to um grab and grope and whistle and howl and you know that's the initial stages but then to eventually make an exchange of um money to purchase someone who's you know ideal in the viewpoint young or innocent or whatever that is like it's pretty pretty intense kind of realization that what i had been contributing to was a wider acceptance and celebration of that entitled behavior and that was a massive turning point for me to have that realization would you i'd love to skip to this because i was going to save this until the end but you're bringing this out in me you know cuz there's this cultural linear line between the drinking and the objectification and the commodification but there's also a lot of internal mechanisms taking place there's the numbing of your conscience there's the justifications that are running rampant there's all these things that are not commonplace in a healthy culture that takes care of themselves which 
so much of it is community. So much of it is spirituality. So much of it is taking care of your internal self, emotional, mental, spiritual, right? And so I know that now you kind of do more spiritual retreats. <laughs> I know as much about you as you show on Instagram. <laughs> I have somewhat of a blind spot, but spiritually, what in your perspective is taking place in a culture where the conscience is so collectively eroding? In a, you know, America was very, it was like overly Puritan for a while, where it's like you look at a woman and you get your eyes <laughs> stabbed or something like that. And we've swung so far in the opposite direction where. It's like, I don't even want to talk to my conscience right now. It has no business with my sex. So in terms of you, again, you were a person, you seem like a really good guy. It seemed like you were raised in a loving family and you were put in a place, kind of like the eye of the storm where no conscience is really allowed in a place like spring break because there's all sorts of unconscionable things taking place. So you were there. And then as you've kind of swung and talking about this in hindsight, it seems like you've evolved. And I guess that's what the second movie is really about is that evolution. But I'd love to kind of unpack that a bit and hear about in your perspective, what is happening with the conscience and with your spirit, all this internal stuff that leads to the erosion, but also leads to the resurrection and to us becoming the evolved version of ourselves. Mm, this is a great question again, man. And to be honest, I feel slightly unqualified to answer it <laughs> your perspective, i'm asking for your perspective you're not representing yeah, humanity sure. just shay I'd yeah love to hear. and yeah my perspective is ultimately what i've come to realize and focus on right now in my life is two primary elements one is self-sufficiency and the other one spirituality because the more that i realize that the more that i discover and realize about myself and the world the more i realize how much i don't know and that's a beautiful thing really humbling and when looking at the spiritual dimension of our human experience and reflecting on our larger cultural kind of positioning and narrative doesn't seem in line with our highest potential, let's say, because the masses, <laughs> if we look back to spring break, it's like the masses of people are, like you said, un unconscious. They're not fully conscious of what they're engaging in, how their behaviors are and what impact that will have on their lives and their future and their families and their friends. And I certainly was in that very unconscious kind of reactive mindset and in that period of my life. And I think this is a whole nother conversation, but I would suggest that it is done by design on a larger scale. And this is very debatable, this whole perspective and belief. But when I really look at the structures of our society, such as our education system, such as our healthcare system, such mm -hmm. as our government system. And we don't even have a kind of education for understanding, comprehending sexuality, just in that sense. My experience growing up in school, we had done sex ed class that was very uninformative and there was no kind of spiritual dimension of sexuality, learning or anything like that. There was, however, a hijacking of our screens as the main storyteller in our culture. And most people are online are watching, I think it's something like 30% of the whole internet is pornography. <laughs> so, and this happened for me. I remember when I was 13 years old and I was at high school and one of my mates came up to me and he goes, oh my God, I just had sex with this girl. I was like, what? I haven't even got pubic hairs, mate. You're talking about having sex with a girl? I hadn't even considered that at that age. But it left a curiosity inside of me. And I thought, oh, I'm going to learn about this. You know, so, and what do I do at that point? I'm just a young kid. I'm not going to go and confront my teachers or my parents. I just go straight to the internet and discover pornography. And then suddenly, you know, that just starts the whole journey, which is, as we've come to know more recently, highly destructive for the neurochemistry in the brain and the dopamine levels and becomes very addictive to get those highly kind of ecstatic and orgasmic feelings over and over and over again, and it becomes more intensified with what triggers that deeper feeling. So you get desensitized, let's say. And all of these quite complex kind of compartments all compile and contribute, even looking at some of the mainstream movies, the messages that are conveyed around sexuality is ultimately 
subconsciously ingraining a belief system to the acceptability of having one night stands or having hookup culture or going against someone's will and going over the edge. And without us actually fully being aware of how that impacts our relationships and our lives and every day to day kind of ongoings. And so I guess from my very limited perspective, the relationship and the role that ultimately spirituality has on the way that we relate to others on an intimate level, it's extremely pivotal and important, so significant to recognize and understand and comprehend really the spiritual nature of this world in order for us to have any level of self-respect and dignity to love others as a way of providing a service of love that's gifting and giving unconditionally rather than this kind of psychological perspective of a young boy who's about take 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 this i need this i must have this mm -hmm. you know i gotta consume this i gotta pay to get this it's a very different perspective to move beyond and identify the needs that we have as human beings because ultimately like sexuality for example is such a key central dimension of our existence the only reason we're here is because two people had sex our mom and dad you know so it's like this notion and i've really like grappled with it and I've, i certainly have much to learn in this area in this space but i kind of see like to simplify it very symbolically it's like fire you know sexuality it's a kind of primordial energy force that ultimately it has tremendous amount of good qualities can be really beautiful and really orgasmic and like a fire can bring warmth to a household. You can cook your food with it. It's like this energy that can be harnessed and controlled in a way that can be very supportive. But then on the other end of the spectrum, if it's, you know, misused and mistreated and left to ravage, it can be a raging bushfire to say the least or burn your entire house down to the ground. And so just acknowledging the potential that that energy has then we can have the awareness of making conscious decision on how we want to choose to use that energy in a positive way or not. And to do that with conscious choice and with our free will is really empowering realization to have. And most people don't even realize the fact that there is a lot of forces that is within us ultimately that is pulling us to fill a void of insecurity which is my story. I was just an insecure young boy looking to find, seeking validation and acceptance and communal kind of belonging, which is innate in all of us. We want to feel a sense of belonging to our tribe and our community and our friends. And the only destructive thing is when you have to do that with a bunch of jocks and guys who are praising you for going and sleeping with as many women, then I quickly scale the ladder and get to the top. I do sense that we are on the verge of a massive cultural, global, planetary shift in the way that we relate to sexual intimacy. And I see films like this playing a really, really big, beautiful role in that journey. And I mean, my story is just one story and I've kind of come to this belief, the spiritual belief that, which I love in my research is that science is now quantum science is backing all of this up and it's been known through the ages and it's not some new age kind of pseudo science that's just coming to the realm. It's like, no, it's like ancient texts have been speaking to this for thousands of years, which is ultimately understanding how energy functions and what energy is and that we're just a part of nature. Our human beings, we're just another mammal on this earth that has these microcosms of energy systems such as our nervous system immune system our cardiovascular system all of these little systems within the bigger system of the human body within the bigger macrocosm of the nature of earth and it's ultimately although we perceive we are separate and there's this perception this story and our culture that i'm me and you're you and you're separate to me ultimately this interconnected thread of subatomic atoms or energy that coexist symbiotically simultaneously all the time and it's really really nice kind of 
belief to grasp onto because then that way, you know, how I treat you and how I treat me is ultimately how I'm going to treat myself. And even more so knowing that life is ultimately impermanent and changing. And, it, and then we can ask those bigger questions about who do we want to be in this life? What do we want to do in this life? There's a beautiful path to be on just as begin questioning on a deeper level and exploring the nature of our reality and how does the sun and the stars and the moon and the planets really impact life on this earth and literally not just the life but the light when we talked about the contrast of light and dark but spending some time with astrologers and cosmologists i've really come to appreciate how stars are primarily on the macro level binary and what does that mean that means they have a relationship with another star same too like on the microcosms as human beings where we like to have a partner we like to have a companion for our life whether it be male or female and sometimes stars like humans have three trimesters there's three of them sometimes but what's happening now which most people aren't aware of and i just want to speak to this to wrap it up because it's quite significant and again this is only my understanding and beliefs of it. i'm not saying this is necessarily true but Again, ancient civilizations like the Mayans had known this for many years, that there is a cycle of stars and there's a cycle of the sun, for example, it's 24 hour cycle. Then we have the yearly cycle. Then we have the great year cycle. And in ancient Indian scriptures, this is known as in the Vedic text as the Kali Yuga. In the Mayan culture, they had also pinpointed this time in the 25,000 year cycle, which is basically a huge cycle that we're unaware of when the two stars with their galaxies so we have our sun star and another star they come closer together and they kind of pivot and then they go back around in their own little cycle why is that relevant and what does that mean well when we're talking about consciousness and we're talking about light and we're talking about bringing the light to the darkness through this story of my experience particularly in sexuality that when this other star comes closer it is a light body meaning that it is a shining light and shining energy that is impacting our planet and light body of our sun, providing more light on this earth. There is literally, physically, in our solar system and in our galaxy, more light that is penetrating on this earth every single day as the cycles, as they get closer. So this is a really comforting knowing for me because ultimately the first thing is that we are locked into these systems. What I mean by that is, I can't say, okay, sun, time to go down now. Let's all move the sun a little bit faster. Or let's just stop the sun today. I can't change these greater systems. And same too, like this new season, this new paradigm, this new system that's coming into its evolution is inevitable. And I think about it, you know, like if I had gone back to that moment in time and chose to close my laptop, run away from going and joining the production team and try and not face it, I'm pretty certain and probably guarantee that if I had chosen that pathway at some point in my life, I was going to get hit way worse and way harder with the realization of what is my truth and my experience. And so I'm grateful that I've chosen the alternative path. And ultimately, I guess that's relevant in this conversation. And I hope that even if just one person has that own realization that the truth will ultimately not only just set you free, but the truth is inevitable and you can't hide from the light. <laughs> yeah. You can only prolong the suffering by avoiding the truth. Yeah, exactly. I feel like I just watched somebody disappear and then just, you gave us something very, it flowed right through you. <laughs> I was looking at your body language too. You were swaying back and forth as you were delivering that message. It was great. Yeah. Thank you. I really want to touch on this last thing because we do have time and space to deal with. I don't want to take too much of your time, but this inevitability of a new future, I think there's like a feedback loop and our consciousness definitely impacts clearly the world around us. And if we're in a good place, we do good things to the world and the people around us. But on a deeper level, we have endless capacity when we're connected to our highest potential. But what stems from that or what we need is also a vision that we're striving for. And so I'd love to hear your vision or an enticing vision of the future, because I have a quote from you from 
the end of the trailer of Liberated After Spring Break, the second movie, you say, if we can work together, then we can move towards this beautiful world that we envision. And I want to know what this world is that you envision and how sex plays into that, because that's really our focus at High Noon and Sexuality. And that's the primary thing that I try to get anybody to do if they're going on this path towards liberating themselves is, well, what is a vision for a liberated version of you look like in terms of sexuality? If you're completely one with your highest self and with God and sexuality, if it was all entwined, what would that look like? How would you wake up? So what does that look like, this better world that you're envisioning? I want to hear it. A, yeah, man, that's such a beautiful question. And I'm going to keep it relatively short and sweet. But I find fulfillment in more simpler things as I've gotten older. And growing food, actually, <laughs> is really significant for me in this season. But also having family is a top value for me. And my vision is I would love to have children one day. You know, I'd love to be a father. I'm really grateful my older sister she's got two little ease now and i get to be an uncle and be playful and have fun and, and enjoy their life and that's a big part of the vision is you provide an environment for a family to really just connect and be together and spend life together and you know have a really joyful loving life ultimately seems kind of cliche in a sense but yeah i just i've come to realize how grateful I am for the family and the friends and the teachers and the mentors that have really supported me and guided me on this journey. And I'm kind of in the space where I just want to give back more and I want to contribute to a thriving world, not a struggling kind of uncertain and scary world. I would rather give back to something that is more fun. And I've had, you know, in terms of sexuality, it's really been a journey for me to feel my emotions on a deep level because my training has been to shut my emotions down and to block it out so i'm really grateful for the partner that i have currently we're always working more intimately just to open our hearts to each other more and just to see each other more we have a practice in our family where we get together every week just to sit in a circle and share what's on our heart what's really going on for us and a lot of the times what i've noticed is that is this emotional suppression often really hinders or impacts the physical intimacy as well so being able to literally drop into the deeper feelings and be open and honest and have a space to share that and articulate it has been really helpful to for me to grow in that space so i'm definitely on a journey and the beautiful thing is like being 30 this year i'm really excited uh, i feel like i'm old but at the same time i feel like i'm really young you know i've got a lot of years <laughs> ahead of me so I'm really excited. And at the end of the day, I have no idea what's around the corner. I've got a lot to learn still. I've got a lot to experience. And yeah, I'm just reminding myself to stay humble and just give back and give love as much as I can and continuing to remind myself that every day. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, in this response, that was the yeah. second time it came up. The vision that you have for yourself when you're in your ideal state, and it seems like something that plays into your vision for humanity. It's about giving, it's freely giving and supporting, not from a childish state, from a powerful state of this is me, here I am and giving. And so that sex becomes more about giving instead of taking, which is what it has been throughout history, which has been self-centered because of the fact that we feel only separation. And so a world of separation creates sex that's separated. It's I'm getting mine, you get yours. But I really like that because I do believe that we are you know, you can see it. Our fates are inevitably entwined. We can't like what happens in Japan, what happens in Africa, what happens in Canada, we're all impacted. So the walls are closing in in that sense. I appreciate that. I like that a lot. I want to say thank you for your time, but also more importantly for like opening up because I feel like we just went on a journey. You really didn't hold back. And I think a lot of people will gain a lot from this. Is it okay if I, in the show notes, put your handle on Instagram so that people can reach out if they want? Oh, thank you, Andrew. Yeah, absolutely. It's so funny. I've really copped a lot having my Instagram handle in the film. And <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be amazed at some of the response that I received from people on a radical ends of the spectrum. I got these comments from people on Instagram because they've seen it through the movie. 
saying, oh, my God, you are like, you're a narcissistic sociopath. And <laughs> you should go to hell. And you like, you're the worst human being on this planet. And like, I had to really alchemize and process a lot of that stuff. Because at the same time, I was getting on the other end of the spectrum, people messaging me saying, oh, my God, you are so hot and amazing. Can you send me some nudes? I want to go party with you. And I want to. And I'm just like in this whirlwind or in between these, like, oh, what is going on? You know, like, I'm just trying to find my center and my core. And you threw me off in a big way, to be honest. (laughs) But yeah, you're welcome to share my Instagram handle. And (laughs) I assure you, our audience is a lot (laughs) different than than that. We're serving a community of people who are actively participating in creating sexual integrity, finding out what they really believe in and aspiring to build a life where the sexuality is in line with that. And so if anything, you'll just get a lot of thank yous. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. No, that's cool. I don't, and again, I like, I don't do this for the thank yous or for any kind of fame or anything like that. It's my intention just to share my experience and my story and in the hope that other people learn and grow and reflect and know themselves more. And that's been a big motivation for me. That's why I, I go around to a lot of local schools and speak with local students and particularly young men who are coming of age and share my story, you know, and share my experience in, with the intention that there's something that their listeners will hold on to and take away and really implement into their life or see things from a new perspective from their own story and have that deeper sense of reflection. So I really want to thank you, Andrew, for great questions and great, great conversations. Man. Yeah, it's really, <laughs> really been a great conversation. Yeah. 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 No, thank you. I appreciate it. It feels like somewhere way back when we're related. I feel like that, you know, as soon as you logged on to this conversation, it's like, oh yeah, I know this guy. We've known each other for thousands of years somehow. So I appreciate you. I appreciate checking up on you again for the first time. And yeah, thanks again, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. No worries, man. Thank you too.